Good morning, everyone. God bless you. He has blessed every one of us because we're here today. Thankful to God for his goodness. Turn to page number 89. It's an old song of praise. And I want you to stand and sing with all your heart, all your throat, all your mind. Blessed be the name. plunged into victory. Amen. Amen. It's good to see a victorious church. Amen. Going forth, conquering, and to conquer. Seems like so many around us are failing and falling. Our world's falling apart. It's aflame with all kinds of problems and heartaches. And it's good on a Sunday morning to look into the faces of people who have the victory. 
Amen. The victory over the world, the victory over sin, the victory over themselves, the victory off the beast, yeah. his image, his mark, his number, his name. Oh, I wish you all understood what that meant. It'd make you shout and run the aisles. Good to see each and every one of you. We uh, have a lot of burdens. We're going to be doing a baby dedication in just a moment. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask Brother George to come. I'm going to take everybody's burdens up, uh, by upraised hands. It's good to see visitors here this morning and then people we haven't seen for a while, Tammy and her husband and others. And we welcome you and we're so thrilled that you're here. And we have been missing you and we want you to know that we love you. And we're glad that you're here. And those of you joining us via live stream, pull yourself up a chair on your couch, whatever, a lazy boy, don't fall asleep, just enjoy the service. Amen? All right, good to see our uh, youth have come back. They had a great time. And uh, some of the others, I see Brad Epperson snuck in, didn't tell me he was going to be here, or I would have had him preaching this morning. <clears throat> but anyway, he's here. And then we got uh, Brother uh, Schwartz's people over here. So make yourself at home. We're here for one reason, right? To glorify God, to thank God, and praise God. We want to remember Tammy, and she has uh, cancer, and she's in the audience, and others that are so afflicted. So good to see uh, the Lewises, and there she is back there raising her hand. Yeah, oh, go ahead, the Wiseman. Yeah, I got the wrong one. Yes, I know. It's, uh, it's the one here in front of you. I'm sorry. Got the wrong girl. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know. I know. Amen. All right, Brother George is going to come. Let's uh, be in an attitude of prayer. It's so good to see everybody. Our Heavenly Father, our Lord God, it's in heaven. Lord, we pray that this day that all of us has gathered in from different corners of, well, the county, the state, even the world, Lord, are here for a purpose in this house to worship you, to lift up our voices in prayer for one another and those that are not here, Lord. There are many things to pray about. And this is the place where we come together and as one voice and as one group to do that before you. We plead our cases, Lord, for those that are sick, those that have cancer, those that are suffering under other afflictions, Lord, that we can't imagine, heartaches, divorce. Lord only knows what goes on in people's houses and homes and behind closed doors. But God, we know you're able to visit each one there are those that are sick that are not here this morning those that are watching on the live stream we pray for each and every one of those that they would receive something from the message something from the songs the inspiration the moving of god's presence among us my god there's so much that we we need so much that i stand in need of and i know others that need help and understanding and wisdom and grace we need a physical touch for our bodies we need we just need everything that a man could possibly want we have young people that are out in the world we pray for each and every one of those those that are here this morning those that are not here lord they struggle they look for you for help we look to you to guide them and help them give them light and understanding of what you want them to do be with our choir members brother sherm whoever sings be with brother tony that these things that go forth we give you the honor with the praise and the, everything from the bottom of our heart belongs to you god our tithes our offerings our testimonies wave a hand a hanky or tears god help us this day to worship you and the holiness and truth that you have passed down through the decades and the years help those that are in caves and basements and those in Hades and foreign countries where the government is oppressive. We have a freedom, Lord, to lift our voice, so we want to do it. We want to praise you and thank you for your kindness and mercy. 
Help us now in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank God for a beautiful day, for his goodness. Thank God for every blessing. We're going to take our morning tithes and offerings, and we're going to sing Heavenly Sunlight. Everybody knows it, just about every word. It's page 283, if you need a book. Number 283. Walking in sunlight all of my journey. sing for us. So, sing that last verse while they're coming. In the bright sun rejoicing passing the way to mansions of all sing his praises gladly I'm walking walking in sunlight sunlight of love heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight
Um, sorry, I'm really sad. We're supposed to still be at youth camp right now. Um, yesterday afternoon, we had 49 kids go to play paintball, and we had 10 kids to go horseback ride, and the storms hit. The power went out, trees came down blocking the roads, and the kids had to come back. So we went back to the lodge and we made the best of it. And then um, we continued on with different activities through the day and the camp director came to me and he said, I don't think the power is coming back on. Um, so I said, okay. I said, can we still have church tonight? He said, that's why we're here. So Brock and Val went to Walmart, they bought us a bunch of lanterns and we were gonna have church. So we had church, and before church started, we gathered and we prayed. And we prayed that if the power came back on after church, we could stay. And the reason we had to leave, because I would have roughed it, the reason we had to leave is because there was no water. So we didn't have running water for showers or restrooms. So we definitely had to come back. So we prayed. God didn't answer that prayer, and that's okay. The morning, so Saturday morning, we were, the girls were getting ready in the bathroom. And we were talking about the miracles of God. And there were different ones that were saying things that they've seen God move when they've prayed. This time we saw God, God chose not to move when we prayed. And that happens as a Christian. And it's a learning experience. I don't understand why and my heart is broken. But I told the kids, I said, we had a great 24 hours. And we can't ask for any more than that. A great 24 hours. I'm thankful for the church help. With the um, money we've raised for youth camp. Um, and we're looking at doing a youth camp maybe in a different place, maybe sooner to make up for the time that we've lost. Um, I'm thankful for the two services we did get to have with them. They were great. God showed up. Um, there's some great friendships that have been made. Um, I'm thankful for the couple congregations that were, come wor were able to come worship with us this morning. Um, I'm thankful for all the chaperones that came to help. I'm thankful for all of your prayers. Um, I just ask that you continue to, be, to pray for the youth. They need all the prayers they can get. Um, we have a great group, and I'm really proud of all of them, and I just ask for your prayers. Thank you. My wife, my daughter will come. We'll sing a song. sang this song until about 50 years ago with brother and sister Wilson. It was kind of one of those songs that you sang on the front porch when you're young because there was no TV and no other thing to pull you away. But it was a great song and I want you to listen to it. It takes two songs and puts them together. Listen.
to ask Miranda and Ryan Mack and Lily May to come on down. You can have a seat right there on the front. Oh, wherever you want to sit, yes. This morning... As you can see, we are going to dedicate little Lila May Avonlea Mack to the Lord. She is the daughter of Miranda and Ryan Mack that are sitting there with her. And Lila is three months old. And I noticed something when they were coming down the altar. Lila, like her mother, is sporting her Easter bonnet early this year. And I've noticed something else. Little Lila, she's got an appetite for bling. <laughs> she's in the right family. Thank God for these wonderful people. The biblical foundation for baby dedications is found Thank God in both the Old and the New Testament. You know the story in 1 Samuel, the first chapter. Hannah was unable to bear a child to her husband. And the servant wife was just ridiculing her, making fun of her, and put her through grief. And Hannah got to praying and said, Lord, if you'll give me a man child, a specific, then I will turn around and dedicate him back to you for all of his days. And what happened? Samuel, the great prophet, was born. And what an amazing thing. Hannah, after uh, she was done nursing little Samuel, she brought him to the priest and dedicated her little boy to God forever. How many of you think you can give your baby away to God forever? Yes. Well, the truth is they belong to God anyway. And eventually he's going to reclaim them. And then in Luke 2.22, Mary and Joseph brought baby Jesus to the temple to present him before the Lord. And you know the rest of the story. He became the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Miranda and Ryan both understand by dedicating their daughter to the Lord. It's a commitment to, rise, to raise Lila May up in the Christian lifestyle. They understand the responsibility. They understand the hardships and the difficulties that are going to ensue because of the way our culture is going. Listen to the command that Moses gave all the parents before Joshua took the people of God into the Canaan land in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. It's one of my best Old Testament chapters. Listen to what uh, Moses commanded. And these words which I command thee this day should be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, listen to this, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, as parents, your responsibility is to keep ever before your children as they grow up, and for the time that you have them before they leave home that you talk to them, pray with them, 
encourage them and continually tell them about God. And more importantly, let them see God in you. And Miranda and Ryan understand that. And then Moses goes on and says, this is the commandment of God to every parent. Keep constantly before them the word of God and play it out before your children in faithful service to God. And then Moses goes on and says, and it shall be, and Ryan and Miranda, this goes for you, this goes for every parent, and it shall be that when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he promised to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, after God blesses you with such beautiful children, a beautiful life, then beware, lest thou, when thou hast eaten and when you've been full, not to forget the Lord. This ceremony is not a substitution for salvation, nor does it eliminate the child's own responsibility to seek the Lord at her time of accountability. What it does, however, is it makes it easier for little Lila May to choose God when she comes to the age of accountability. Ryan and Miranda, it'll be a lot easier for Lila May to give her heart to God when she sees as she grows up the God likeness in both of you. So pray with her, read Bible stories to her, and keep her in church. Ryan and Miranda, there is no greater task you both can give yourself to than setting a godly example before your little girl. I'm going to ask you three questions and you can answer with we do. Miranda and Ryan, do you here this day dedicate as Lila May's parents this child to the Lord who gave her to you? Miranda and Ryan, will you on this day seek God's wisdom and strength to help you raise Lila May in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Do you hear this day promise as parents to give Lila May every possible benefit of a Christian upbringing? With that said, we are now going to have the dedicatory prayer. And I'm going to ask Donna Romine if she'll come down. I'm going to ask the audience to stand in honor of this dedication. And I'll give Donna a mic. What a beautiful little baby. I usually pick them up, but I don't know how to hold them. I see her. <laughs> I can hold her? Okay. Well, wait, what are you doing? Oh, oh. Now, don't let your head flop all over the place. Oh, I have to hold her head. Yeah. Yeah. Right, there you go. <laughs> Just support it. You want me to hold her while we pray? Sure. All right. Look at me, I'm a chick magnet. <laughs> Hi, little girl. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we humbly bow yes. before you today, dear God, it's with a thankful heart, Lord, for this special part of the service. As we bring these parents and this baby before you. Father, we're thankful that Marina. And this baby's daddy, I forgot his name, I'm sorry. Ryan. 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 <laughs> no. The <laughs> Lord knows. We're thankful, dear God, that they see the need yes. Amen. to dedicate this baby to you. 
Lord, I just pray you'll bless these two parents. Bless their marriage. Make it a happy home, a happy marriage, dear God. And one, Lord, where you're honored and you're welcomed into that home. And I pray you'll fill their home with your spirit. Father, that you would help them in all their decision making and all their planning. I pray they'll put you first. Father, for in dedicating in this baby, they're dedicating themselves first and foremost. And we just pray that you'll help them to honor the vows, Lord, that they made today. That they'll never forget them, dear God. The enemy's going to see to it, dear God, that... This might be difficult, it might be hard, but God, through your power and your strength, Lord, it's a task that can be done. And I just pray to your Lord for this precious baby. I pray, Lord, this very minute that you'll put something in her little mind and her little heart that will always love you, dear God, and have a desire to serve you. Lord, I pray you'll make her a light in this world, wherever she goes, whatever she does, Lord, that... People will see it in her, dear God, that this one, this one's different. This one's special for she's dedicated to you, dear God. I just pray, Lord, that you'll bless this couple. Keep your arms around them. Bless their home. And for what you do, dear God, we'll give your name the thanks and praise. Amen. I'm going to ask that the audience give them a round of applause and appreciation (laughs) for the lifestyle that they're going to bring Lila Mae into. God bless you. We'll be praying for you. My wife and I never had children, so... Sometimes I don't know what to do. If you have the Bible, turn to the book of Acts, if you will, please, the second chapter. Sherman, Evelyn, and Tanny just sang a beautiful song. I can see Brother Wilson when he would be preaching and when he would finish. Or he would just go right into the song. I wouldn't miss it, would you? And you know what's tragic? There are many that are going to miss it. And my question to you this morning is, are you going to miss it? If you miss it, Serving God, loving God, you will have missed the greatest thrill and the greatest experience that all of life has to offer. You will have missed everything. And in the end, you will have nothing but regrets and heartaches. When in a lost eternity, You're reminded over and over again of the opportunities that you had. But you squandered them away. And you let the intoxication of this old world get you and cause you to miss the greatest thrill in life. That is knowing the Lord. Acts 2, and we're all familiar with the text. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost." And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there just happened to be, folks, there were dwelling that day in Jerusalem thousands and thousands of Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. 
Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? These people are not learned altogether. They, they're not linguists. They don't speak a lot of languages. But we hear them speaking in our native tongues the wonderful works of God. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Pentecost is one of the most amazing stories in the world. It's the launch of the Christian church. It's the story of how the church, who was quietly in the upper room, hiding in obscurity, but awaiting the promise of the Holy Spirit, and then suddenly they became conscious of a divine power that would turn the world upside down. One thing was evident, their love for Jesus Christ was the one thing that held them together. And that's the thing that's not working today and not holding our cultures, our cities, and our nations, and our races together. We've lost our love for God and our love for one another. And all nations that forget God are going to be turned into hell. There they were, afraid, terribly timid, and very conscious of their weakness, but they found themselves suddenly in a possession of a boldness and courage, and they never, and that they never dreamed of having. I want to tell you something. The Holy Ghost can do things that nobody else in this world can do can turn your life right side up, can give you boldness, can give you wisdom, can give you understanding. And without the Holy Ghost, this whole world is floundering and scrambling and trying to find something and trying to find it in the world, but the world doesn't have anything to give. Only God Their lives came into immediate contact with God's power. And now they could go outside into the world and knew that God had their back. There's so much fear, so much canceling of one another, so much accusing one another at not being woke. There's so much nonsense going on in this world. And people are falling for it. And colleges are falling for it. And businesses and CEOs. Everybody's falling for it. And what everybody needs is the boldness and the strength and the backbone of the Holy Spirit so they can stand up and look in their face and say, you're wrong. Instead of being intimidated and going out and committing suicide and doing foolish things. They now had the power to think like Jesus and grow like Jesus, not from the slavery of rigid uh, legalism, but from the power of an inward life. It's a continual discovery. When the Spirit shows up, it's a continual discovery of new truth. The Holy Spirit is the living mind of God at work in our minds unfolding and enlarging our thoughts and awakening us over and over to new revelations of God and new ideas on how to glorify God. We don't know how to behave until God gets a hold of us. And that's evident by what's going on out there. When those in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit and they came out into the streets preaching... There were thousands of people at the feast. 
and each nation from the Far East and from Asia and from Palestine and from Egypt and from the Roman Empire and the Greeks and beyond. This is amazing. There were so many nations, so many backgrounds, so many cultures there. But every one of them, with all their differences, with all their traditions, with all of this and all of that, they heard the gospel in their own language from those 11 who were in the upper room. And though these many nations were so different in origin, character, traditions, habits, and languages and customs, every single nation heard the gospel in their own language which fit their culture, their understanding perfectly. That was a miracle of all miracles. It was not only a linguistic miracle. It was a gospel that each nation could understand in spite of all their differences. Now understand, this God used the gift of tongues... A understandable, intelligent language to address various nations that were present. It was not a frenzy, a violent shaking, an unintelligible, illeg illegitimate, and incomprehensible garble which no one could understand. And neither is it taught anywhere in the Bible where garbled speech is the evidence of the Holy Spirit John the Baptist hit the nail right on the head when all the religious bureaucracy of their day came up to John to be baptized. How would you like to have John for a pastor? And they came up to John and they wanted to be baptized and John looked them up, he looked them down, he looked them over left and right and he said, who hath warned you? Amen? What did John call him? How would you like to have a pastor and you come to church on a Sunday morning and says, now listen, vipers. <laughs> but he addressed them as they needed to be addressed. He confronted them as they needed to be confronted. And he looked at them and he said, who hath warned you, snakes, to flee from the wrath of God? Go therefore and bring forth fruit that validates that you truly repented. It isn't a shaken, a frenzy, talking in unintelligible language. God does things in decency and order. Whenever an angel had to come down and talk to Daniel, he didn't come down and talk in a gobbledygook. Because they go over to Corinthians and say, well, the tongues of men and angels. Well, did you ever hear an angel's tongue? Every angel that came down and talked to anybody in whatever nation, whatever language, he spoke an understandable language. No angels flew off the, off the handle. You with me? There's so much hustling and deception going on in this world in the name of religion. And never was a nation so naive. A nation, a civilized nation, and their foundation was based on the word of God and, and, and prayer and what have you. And look at America today. They don't know their right hand from their left from the top to the bottom. The only reason the gift of tongues was given. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over the place. They didn't know anybody in the upper room. They didn't care. There was 120 of them. So how was the connection going to be made from all the multitudes of people out there and the 120 that were shaking in their shoes and afraid to come out? A rushing mighty wind showed up. 
And it had the roar of a tornado, but there was no destruction in it. It was noise, and when it was all noised abroad, and then the cloven tongue sat on them, and it sat on each one of them, and they got the boldness, and they came out into the street, and all those nations started to hear the wonderful works of God in their own language. And they said, are not these Galileans? These people are from the hood. They don't know anything. But they heard them speak the wonderful works of God in their own language. Now get it and get it straight because there's people in this church that still don't have it straight. What was the reason for tongues? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, wherefore, because there was confusion in Corinth, and all of the chapters in Corinth, God was knocking dirt off. They weren't a utopia of spirituality. And Paul had to remind them, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And so you got thousands of people all around Pentecost and, and they're hearing people for the first time speak in their own language who they know can, they can't speak their language. And that was the hook. That was the sign miracle that brought them out. And, and, and it was God working a miracle through languages to get all the lost people in that mob to stop and say to themselves, they're Jews, they know there were miracles in their history, and it was the gift of tongues speaking a language that people don't ordinarily know. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. The only reason the gift of tongues was given on the day of Pentecost was given to us by Paul. God was doing something special. And that something special that God was doing was bringing the whole world, both the Jews and the Gentiles, the non-Jews, into salvation. These great Pentecostal events, listen carefully, in Acts 2, in Acts 10, down at Cornelius' house, this is where I got in, the, the Italians... Amen, that's my door I came through. And the Jews, who looked at the Italians like they were scum, can you imagine the nerve of that? If I fed them my meatballs and macaroni, they'd love me. But when the Jews saw the same gift that came down on Pentecost, came down on the Italians, and they started to speak the wonderful things of God, that was another miracle that convinced those biased, prejudiced, racist Jews to know that God, no matter what man or woman, if they respected God in whatever nation, God found them favorable and gave them the same gift that he gave us on the day of Pentecost. Period. But these wonderful events in Acts 2, 10, and 19, rooted in history, are not to be repeated any more than the babe in Bethlehem, or the event on Calvary, or the resurrection in the empty tomb. And since that time, Everybody receives the Holy Spirit 
as the believers did at Pentecost. Pentecost is one of the most solemn happenings in the world. God finally has a new dwelling place in the earth. It's where he was wanting to get from the very creation of the world. And he wanted to get in my heart and he wanted to get in your heart. We as the temple of God, you ever stop and thought about this? We are the temples of God. If so be the Holy Spirit dwells within us. God had one aim from the time he created everything. And that was to get down inside of the heart and mind of the apex of his creation, the human being. We as the temple of God carry God with us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of God comes into my heart, the Trinity comes into my heart. And everywhere we go, what we drink, God drinks. What we watch, God watches. What we think, God knows. What we say, God knows. Where we go, God knows. Because you're carrying the Trinity in your own heart. That's why you got to be careful how you treat one another. Amen? That's why you got to be careful you don't uh, go through these mood swings and act crazy all the time. You've got to be reminded that you have God inside of you. And you can't just say GD and, and JC and uh, the H with this and the H with you. You've got God in you. And you've got to act like it. Oh, what happened on Pentecost needed to happen in this world. The power of conviction through the Holy Spirit convinces sinners of their need of God. One preacher put it like this, and I thought it was an excellent, excellent parallel. He said that in conversion, the Holy Spirit is like an obstetrician who brings us into the world of the saved. And when we get started with the obstetrician, the Holy Spirit becomes like a pediatrician, leading us to health and strength and growth and maturity. And we are being sanctified by the truth over and over and over again. Today, our nations are no longer civil but they have become a record of man's shame and inhumanity to man, and they dishonor God. But I want to encourage you with this. There's no age throughout the history of the world that has not been so evil, nor so dark, nor so wicked, that God could not always say, I have 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You can look out here and see that it's a mess. It looked like nobody's right. But God always had and always will have a church. And Jesus said, I will build it and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, thank God. There's something that's working in this world. So what does Pentecost teach us? It teaches us the inwardness. It teaches us the inwardness of true religion. Christianity is not only something believed, it is something experienced. Christian conversion is a supernatural invasion of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost coming into our lives with power. Christianity was never meant to be a religion of elaborate rituals and hocus-pocus draperies. Featuring the powers of priests and bishops as the central mediators between God and man. How ridiculous. 
1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. That eliminates all the pastors, all the preachers, all the popes, all the cardinals, all this, all that. The only thing between us and God is the man, Jesus Christ. That's why he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And nobody gets to the Father except they come through me. But you got all this paraphernalia added to how people are going to be saved and what they have to do and all the hoops they got to jump to uh, jump through. It is absolutely ridiculous. I wish I had my suspenders on. <laughs> These three down here, right here in the front row, they say, what? Every time I get up to preach or say something, they, they say to one another, now watch, now watch. He's going to get up. Let's pray the Holy Ghost falls on them. <laughs> and leave my pants alone. <laughs> Christianity. I'm in a mess today. <laughs> my neighbor come over. And uh, we're going to renew his vows across the street from me and I've got 27 neighbors coming over and I was cleaning the house this morning about 7 o'clock and running the vacuum sweeper and doing, doing, doing this and doing that and then I had to do the dedication then I had to preach the sermon and I thought well, Lord lighten up <laughs> but anyway that's going to be a nice event too but Christianity is something more than believing. It's receiving. Christianity was never meant to be a religion of elaborate rituals and hocus pocus of draperies featuring the powers of men. Pentecost teaches us exactly that. Our experience of God doesn't come through priests or ceremonies or water baptism or the Lord's Supper or indoctrination. It comes down from God out of heaven with power in and through the Holy Ghost. And the tents, tabernacles, temples, and buildings of man were all bypassed on the day of Pentecost. Christianity is God no longer in temples of man's buildings, but immediately known and possessed in the human heart through direct invasion of the Holy Spirit. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God came into man's heart, not just to our reason, not just to our intellect, but into the very center of desire and emotions and our responsive attitudes. How many professing Christians are living in this heart enrapturing experience? It's sad, but not enough. And I dare say the rank and file of nominal Christianity is not experiencing what these people experienced on the day of Pentecost. Look at them, 120 of them. They were a group of praying people. Note some things about them. They loved the place of prayer. Acts 1.14, they were all gathered together. It was prayer which made these human vessels ready to receive the infilling of God's Spirit. I'm afraid we don't think as much as we should about the coming and person and the work of the Holy Spirit. He came to make Christian prayer the mightiest weapon on earth, and that's still the greatest weapon on earth. Get a bunch of people who love God and have the Holy Spirit 
the Father and the Son inside of them and get them to pray. And I'm telling you, the fireworks will begin. It is the key to notice that Luke said in verse 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And then Acts 14, it says these all continued with one accord. It's mentioned twice. It's mentioned twice before the Spirit fell. It was the continued prayer together that ridded those disciples of all discord. Heaven's fire doesn't fall on discord. The Holy Spirit doesn't anoint discord. Some were full of strifes and competitive ambitions, but now they were all down before God in unifying humility, and they were in love with one another. But Luke mentions in twice, in Acts 1, 14 and 2, they were all with one accord. Everybody had it going on. In other words, there were no grudges. There was no seeking of the uppermost seats in the synagogue. There was no cruel gossip. It was the sustained prayer and unity of hearts that made them ready for the mighty power of God's Spirit. One of the reasons the churches has so little power today is because they don't have enough power to love one another with pure hearts fervently. And the Bible says, there were added unto them 3,000 souls. And you want to know something? What preached back there? It will still preach today. If the same pattern is adopted, it will still preach today. Somebody says, well, why are things so different? And the answer, where are the 10-day prayer meetings? They were praying for 10 days. There was no discord. Their hearts were pure. There was no splits. There was no fighting. There was no fussing over doctrines and over standards and over here and there. Notice how the Holy Spirit suddenly appeared. Why? Because 4,000 plus years, God was waiting for the moment when he could dwell in us instead of around us. Listen to Romans 5. God never intended for Christianity to be a religion of outward rituals, ceremonies, and sacraments. Sacraments, just something to believe. The inside, the inside has to come clean. And if the inside is truly clean and the Trinity abides in you, I can guarantee you the outside will come clean. He wanted his love to be shed abroad in and through our hearts by the Holy Ghost. He wanted inward holiness instead of all the outward draperies of hideous externals. Notice how Paul explains where God's love was imparted. The love of God is shed abroad where? In our hearts. Not just into our heads. And notice by who it was imparted. It was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. This salvation came down from heaven through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Men had nothing to do with it, and that's where we are today. You're either going to accept it or reject it. You're either going to miss it or you're not going to miss it. 
God doesn't want temples, tents, and tabernacles with all the trimmings to dwell. He wants my heart in your heart. Now let me show you quickly what the aim of Pentecost is really all about, as characterized by the symbols which were shown on the day of Pentecost. First, there was the rushing sound from heaven, and it was a sound as a rushing mighty wind. What could better illustrate the overwhelming almightiness of the Holy Spirit to envelop believers in power to crush and overthrow the power of sin? Immediately following the mighty wind, verse 3 says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Besides the wind, there was the fire. The fire for intensity. The fire to search and to purify and to refine the unknown secrets of the heart. And don't miss this. The fire was not just a shapeless flame. It appeared in cloven tongues. The symbol of the New Testament gospel today is a tongue of fire. Human speech aflame with the divine presence and the love of God. This is the church's greatest weapon, our power to witness effectively for God. God gets a hold of the tongue and the fire inside of the bosom. And when that comes out of your mouth and when the tongue has preached the gospel, it becomes the power of God unto salvation. But you can't preach it sarcastically. You can't preach it with an attitude. You can't preach it with anger. You've got to preach it like Jesus preached it. He loved them who despitefully used him. He loved his enemies. Now look at the results and I'm through. The purpose of God in dwelling our hearts and when the crowds, in verse 12, asked, what meaneth this? For many were amazed and in doubt, and others were mocking. Verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven, he lifted up his voice. He lifted up his voice. And he began to preach to the multitudes. Now, I want you to get a hold of this. Can you imagine the barriers and the difficulties that they were facing and that Peter was facing? Just a few days he li before that, he lied to the little damsel. The Jews hated Jesus because he professed to be the Son of God. They would look at Jesus and Jesus said, would say to them right back, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My Father and I are one. They hated him. First, Peter had to preach the truth. He had to have the guts and the intestinal fortitude to look people in the face and tell them the truth in love. That's one of the great features of Pentecost. People standing up and having the fire of God on their tongue and preaching the truth no matter who hears it. There's a brother here this morning. He was a youth leader, elementary do you know how many churches in this town have already caved in to all this nonsense? To all this trans? To all this gay stuff? To all this same-sex marriage? And the brother just put it on his computer that homosexuality was wrong. And people in his same church came to him and said, hey, wait, that, that was wrong. You can't say that. Why can't I? 
because we just baptized the pastor and his wife's daughter, and she's gay. You know how many churches are buying that now? Have you ever noticed, you hear about it all the time, you hear about the trans, you hear about the gay, you hear about all the nonsense and, and the abomination that's going on, but not once there's ever a, a, a news thing, pick up the Bible and read Romans the first chapter. Why don't you tell them the truth? And the reason you can't tell them the truth because you're still in the upper room shaking in your boots. Ye shall know the truth. Not the truth coming out of Washington. Not the truth coming out of Hollywood. Ye shall know the truth that comes down from God out of heaven. Amen. And notice also that fire sat on each of them. No exceptions were made then or today where biblical conditions are met. It sat on each of them, not merely as a collective unit, but as an individual human beings who were in spiritual union with God. The Holy Spirit will connect in our churches only with those who have been truly saved. It sat upon them, indicating that God's Spirit came to stay. You know when your wife comes along and sits on your lap and puts her arm around you? She came to stay. Some of you still don't get it. What do you want? <laughs> All the things that ought to be preached from this pulpit. And they went out among the thousands of Jews who were there and preached the wonderful works of God. Now let's look at the results and the purpose that God of God indwelling. And when the crowds in verse 12 asked what meaneth this, for many were amazed and in doubt and others were mocking. But verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and he began to preach. Can you imagine the barriers and difficulties that were facing Peter? Peter had to look into the face of people who were prejudiced and biased and racist. And he had to drive home the guilt to these Jewish nations, to those who killed the Son of God. There could not be any compromise in his language or his preaching. No flattery and soft selling of the gospel. And no being afraid that the people will reject you. His commission from God was to preach the truth and nothing but the truth. And to preach it in love. The blood of the most shocking crime in history was upon them. And Peter stood up and said, you with wicked hands have taken the Son of God and you've murdered him. And the Bible said, it pricked them in the heart. Because it was coming off a cloven tongue that had the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Revelation 14, when a divine ministry thrust in the sickle into the earth, that was the word of God when the preachers were going out and trying to harvest. And then they were cast into the great wine press right here. You put the grapes into the wine press and you step on them to see if they're good fruit. And then you put the souls of men in the wine press and you preach the word and see if there's good fruit. Now listen to this. And verse 20 says, when they put them into the wine press... Blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. Then you got preachers standing up, well-known preachers, and talking to you, oh yeah, when the Antichrist comes 
And when the millennium comes, and when the rapture, the third or fourth rapture comes, oh, the blood's going to run as high as the horse's bridle. I got a message for you, preacher. Woke up. When it says the blood comes up to the horse's bridle, horse in the revelation means military, militant. They have the white horse going forth to conquer and conquer. And then along comes the red horse, paganism. And then along comes the, the, uh, the, gray, the pale horse, the black horse, which is apostasy. And then comes the pale horse, which is death. And around 270, this world, country, went into 12, 1,600 years from 270 when the Bible says a great mountain on fire, that's the church, and it fell into the sea. It compromised. It backslid. They lost the fire. And for 1,260 years through the dark ages, papalism murdered through their popes and through their leaders and through the civil forces, 65 million Christians were martyred. Look it up on your phone. It'll tell you about the dark ages. And the blood ran to the horse's bridle. The horse is the militant force, the political, spiritual force. But the blood ran up to the horse's bridle because who's holding the bridle? Who's steering the horse? And it was the papacy for 1260 years and all these others who's whose religion didn't come down from God out of heaven, it came up out of the sea. It came out of the minds of men. And the blood is nothing but the guilt that's coming to the one that's steering the horse and ordering all the genocide and ordering all those to be burned at the stake and ordering all these to be tortured because they love God. And let me tell you something. That's still what they're after today. That's why they're bringing up hate speech. That's why they're bringing up all this other stuff. They want to implement a gag order against Christianity where preachers like myself and God willing a whole bunch others are willing to stand up and preach the truth no matter what you think. And sure, everybody wants to be liked. But if you ever start preaching the gospel, don't think that's going to happen every day. Peter's second disadvantage, he was now supporting a new faith, a new doctrine, a new sect of new religion without any history, without college. That's where I got in. I didn't have any college. And I meet these sophisticated preachers, the first thing they ask, well, where did you graduate from? I graduated from the Holy Ghost at God's Acres. I grabbed the coattail of a man of God, and I learned more about God following him than I would have known following these educators today. The teachers union, they ought to be thrown out. They don't even know what they're talking about anymore. He was supporting a new faith, a history without college, without prominent letters of recommendation, and the leader of his new religion, he was a murdered blasphemer. So Harry's trying to promote Christianity and they just got done murdering him because he was a blasphemer and the Jews were jumping up and down and so glad they murdered the Christ. And Peter had to overcome it all. How did it happen? Fire came into his soul. 
Holy Ghost power. Another hurdle Peter faced was challenging a bitter and hateful, prejudiced bunch of people because he was attacking the scribes and the Pharisees fanatical and radical Judaism. They were still seething from what John told them. Who hath warned you snakes to flee from the wrath of God? All their political power, Judaism, all their political power and their cliques and their religious pride and their mob-like mentalities wanted to take Peter out and stone him. And lastly, in the eyes of all the leaders and learned in the multitudes, wanted to take Peter out and stone him, but lastly, the eyes of all the leaders and learned in the multitudes, Peter came over as an uneducated fool. According to academic standards of the Jews' religion, Peter was a nobody. Peter wore no lettered sweaters from Harvard or Yale, you all. He didn't speak the eloquent and finesse, and as a great orator, he came over as a country bumpkin. He came over as a homely fisherman. He had no right to disclaim, disclaim the superiority of the Jews' religion any more than Mr. Rogers went to Washington. Yet look at how God cleaned house through that man's sermon. They were pricked in their hearts. God gave them heartburn. And they cried out in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What a preaching pattern for us today. What a preaching exploit. What a demonstration of the power and presence of the Holy Ghost power. 3,000 souls were pricked in their hearts and God saved every one of them. How did it happen? For one thing, they just came out of a prayer meeting. I want to tell you something, Church of God. If there's any church that shouldn't get soft when it comes to religion out there, it shouldn't be us. Because God has blessed us with a hundred years of good revelation preacher, preaching. And we know, we know who the beast is. We know who the image is. We know what the mark of the beast is. We know what his number is. We know what their names are. And yet I hear Church of God people getting soft. And talking all friendly like. Well, they're all religious out there. And look at all the big churches. And oh, they're all doing so good. Yeah, and their congregations are filled. And people shacking up, cohabitating. They're gay. They're this. They're that. And they're all sitting in a pew being made to feel like they're right with God. Why don't you tell it like it is? The biggest operation in this world. That is sad. It's false religion. Man-made religion. And you stop any, any religious movement. Every denomination. They'll tell you who the head of the movement is. But let them ask us who the head of the movement is. And we'll say there's only one head. And there'll never be another head. And his name is Jesus Christ. It's not Dr. So-and-so or double LD so-and-so. Or Ph.D. so-and-so. It's Ph.D. prayed heaven down. Those are the ones. You with me? Amen, brother. I'm not saying you have to be rude and insulting. And there was a time when I was. And there was a time when I preached. I preached to impress people instead of to help them. 
But the pediatrician got a hold of me and helped me to understand what I needed to understand. What a preaching pattern, what a preaching exploit, what a demonstration of the power and presence of the Holy Ghost. Prevailing with God is always the best preparation. I'm closing. Come on, let's sing a song. I got another service waiting for me in my backyard. 3,000 souls were pricked in their hearts. And all the way through his preaching, Peter, he stuck with the scriptures. All the way through, he focused on Christ. And all the way through, he was filled with the Spirit. That's Pentecostal preaching. But what do we have today in millions of pulpits? Soft selling, soft peddling, and soft preaching so as not to offend our cupcake culture and those whose heads are buried in the sand, church members. God wants spirit-filled believers with tongues of fire preaching in love the everlasting gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and leave the fluff and the puff and the huff for man-made religion. I want to ask you a question. Been your pastor for 36 years going on. How many of you do re really really appreciate the truth. Amen? So almost all of you raised your hands. I didn't see a lot of hands while I was preaching. Amen. God bless you. I wish it was an octopus. I'd have them all up. <laughs> what am I saying? When you got a man of God that preaches you the truth, you ought to do everything you can to make it easier on him. And don't say to yourself, oh, oh boy, I'm, I'm glad I didn't bring my Catholic friends to church this morning. That's because your head's buried in the sand. The best thing you can do is tell people this. Am I right? You know I'm right. I just picked you up, Mariah and McElroy. God bless you. I didn't know if you were here today. Well, I guess it's time to go. Tam, come on down. We're going to have prayer with you. This is Tammy West, and the one in the back is Tammy Wiseman. I got them mixed up. You, you can stay there if you want or come on down. You don't have, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. That brother will help you behind you if you want to come on down. Tammy, have a seat. Please, page 167. God bless you this morning. Listen, when you go home, take a moment to find an altar you can use this one if you want today. But find a place where you can get down before God and you can ask Him to give you more of this Holy Ghost business. And be willing to move over and make more room for Him. I look at our youth, I know what you want. You all want to find a good-looking man, a good-looking woman. I don't blame you. But the real way to get one and to reel one in is to get down on your knees. And when you're down on your knees, you're taller than trees. That's how my wife prayed me in. I was in New York. What's the chances of me coming to Newark, Ohio? A million to one. But she was praying. And ladies, look at what she caught. Some of you won't smile for nothing.
And it's true. You can pray a good man in, and you can pray a good woman in. And it'll happen. Tammy's got cancer. She's been struggling, and who wouldn't? Donna, come on down, lay hands on this gal. And you know, there's people in this audience right now that are struggling. And you got burdens. And some of you have received bad news. And some of you can't hardly keep your head above water because all the burdens and the problems and all the people out there that hate you because you stand for Christ. And if anybody else needs prayer, come on down. We're going to pray. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Donna's going to anoint him. We're going to pray. And you know, I'm just going to add, I know there's a lot more in, you, in this audience that need prayer physically and spiritually. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and if you're one of those people that needs prayer, all the way through, I want you to raise your hand just indicating that you're part of the group that needs prayer. Go ahead, bow your head, stop peeking, and raise your hand if you need prayer. I see the hands being raised all over the place. God bless you people that are raising your hand. That's a good start. You can put your hands down. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of God, for the gift of your dear son, for how you brought yourself down and took on human flesh. God, there was no other way that we could relate or get to understand you. You're a spirit. But when you sent Jesus Christ down into this world and he became human flesh and walked among us and had no sin, neither was there any guile in his mouth, we saw you, Father. We saw your love. We saw your compassion. We saw your sacrifice. And that helped us to relate to the God that we can't see. Now, Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we know that when the Holy Spirit fell throughout the Bible, wonderful things happened. Souls were saved. Bodies were healed. Many were added to the kingdom of God. And Lord, we pray this morning that you look upon Tammy with favor. Lord, she knows she regrets some of the habits, some of the struggles in life got the best of her. We can all testify to that. We can all say that. But thank you, oh God, that you've come. And you've come with power to heal and to save and to deliver. And we pray this morning in the name of Jesus that name which is above all other names, that you'll touch our sister and that all these hands that were raised, every burden, every trouble, every torment, whatever it is that's limiting them, God set them free this morning. Whom the soul sets free is free indeed. Thank you, O oh God, for the privilege to come to an altar and to ask for your help. Thank you for the new people that are here. The Montgomery's, the McElroy's. Good to see the Schwartz. Good to see them all. And Lord, keep on bringing them in. And may your Holy Spirit keep adding to the church those that are saved 
Lord, we're here to see people saved. We're here to keep people saved. And so, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this people that's so willing to want to hear the truth. And Lord, set us all a little freer this morning. Help us to move over and give you a little more room in our hearts this morning so that we can be more like you and do greater exploits. Thank you, Father, for the service. Thank you, O oh God, for meeting with us this morning. Thank you for little Lila May and her parents and all the saints and parents that have children. Thank you for our youth. What a great group. Thank you for the youth leaders and all the staff. Now, Lord, help us as the days get darker, that we'll get stronger. In the precious name of Jesus, let the holy fire fall on us. Oh, God, grant it. Sherm, can we sing a verse? Let the fire fall on us. Do you know it? If not, sing whatever you're going to sing. We'll sing a song, a verse, and we'll let you go. You've been a great audience. Good to see each and every one of you. God bless your hearts. Lord, I would be holy thine. Listen. I would know thy Sing it if you know it. From would I play Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Who knows it? Who knows it? You know that song now? She can't hear. And let that be your prayer. Lord, put a fire in me that'll cause me to catch up. That'll help me to get ahead spiritually. 14? 214 in your songbook. Let the fire. One more verse. God bless you. You've been a great. I would have sufficient grace. What is it? Every to bravely face. And an overcomer evermore to be. That I will be fill my place. And that I may win this race. Let the holy fire from heaven fall on me. Let the fire. God grant it, God grant it. Testing one, two. Let the fire, let the fire fall on me. All right, God bless you. Uh, I've been reminded that you got to bring in candy for Easter, and we need lots of candy. Saturday at 11, on what Saturday? Oh, this Saturday coming? Okay. God bless you. You're all dismissed. <laughs>